Good morning. Thanks for being here at such a cold morning. It was really, really cold this morning. <laughs> okay. But exponents and logarithms definitely warm us up. <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> okay. So that's what I'm planning for to, to do today. Um, again, as usual, starts from very slow, easy, from the very beginning. So I'm going to go through the laws of exponents and then uh, revise the laws of logarithms. I'll show you two video links where you can, again, revise them towards the exam because between now and the exam is quite a bit of a time. Uh, then we're going to go into solving exponential equations and solving, logar uh, solving logarithmic equations a little bit. Then how to differentiate them. Uh, and the last two topics is logarithmic differentiation and homogeneity. Um, in my experience, these two things confuse students a little bit at the first time because it's something very new. You're not always sure why you have to do it. Uh, but once you give it a go, uh, try it a couple of times, it's actually quite easy to um, fall into the rhythm of the uh, solution process. So, mathematics is supposed to be the clear subject when there are no confusions. But as everything, mathematics is also uh, goes by exceptions, meaning for one concept, we have got three different names. Exponent, powers, and indexes refer to all the same thing when you have got something in the power. So, by definition, anything, and I, by that mean anything raised to the zero power is always equal to one. Don't try to find logic in there. It has to be like that. Mathematics otherwise doesn't work. Anything to the first power is itself. Now that makes a little bit more sense because you need to multiply something by itself once. You basically don't do anything to the number. Negative power is 1 over the positive equivalent of the same power. Now this can be proven. This is not so-called a definition. Uh, but it's always good just you remember how, uh, why it works. A fractional power of 1 over n fractional power, that is the same as the nth root. So square root would be the same as a half power and the rest of it. Now if you have got an n over m power, that's mixing together the powers and the roots. And always the denominator is your root and the numerator <laughs> is your power. Okay, these are rules that you have to know. Without them, it will be quite difficult to sort of manipulate things. Now, there are also other laws, and these ones probably more familiar. When you're multiplying the same bases with different powers together, you just have to add the powers together. If you divide the same bases, but uh, at different powers, you subtract the powers. And if you raise something to uh, a power and then raise it to another power again, you just multiply the powers together. Again, should not be anything new, but I just want to make sure that we're all clear on where we're uh, going. Some of the uh, kind of further explanations are on this website, so if you ever have to catch it up, it's uh, quite good because it starts from zero and takes you through all of the laws and gives you a bit of an explanation why they uh, are the way they are. So, let's start some practice questions. So, what's the answer to the first one? E to the 7. Answer to the second one? Answer to the third one? P to the? 12, because you're multiplying them together now. Answer to the 4. Six. 1 over 8. 8, because it's 1 over 2 to the 3rd, and 2 to the 3rd is 8. Uh, 5. Which one is the root? The 2 or the 3? Three? 3 is the root. So it's going to be the cube root of 5 squared. 6. Well, 
Yes, the negative is one over, and then fifth root of four to the three. Again, five is in the denominator, so that's going to be your root uh, seven. Just a, because negative four plus positive three makes positive. Uh, sorry, other way around. Positive four and negative three makes positive one. Um, how about eight? What's going on in eight? I've got the same power, uh, the same base, p, but now I'm dividing them. What do I need to do with the powers then? No. Subtract them. So negative one third, take away two third. Minus one. So that's p to the negative one, which is equal to one over p. Nine. X to the minus ten, which then I can rewrite as one over x to the ten. And the last one. Let's attempt it term by term. So what would be the first? What happens in here in the first term? I'm multiplying the same bases together. So what do I need to do with the indices, the powers? Add them together. So it will be 5x plus 2y. Add. What's going on on the t uh, second term? E is raised to the 2x, and then I have to raise that to the third power. So when I'm raising a power to a power, what do I need to do? Yes. I can hear the whispers <laughs> multiply it together. I, I, determine, I determine that I get you talking. Okay, so then what will be the power? 6x. Now. Can we do anything else at this stage? Probably, really depends on how much details you have to go into it. First thing is that we do not have a rule for adding powers together. Especially not in the case when they have got different exponents. But what I can see here that there is 5x and there is 6x here. So if I really wanted to go into some complex algebraic manipulations, I can probably break this down, uh, kind of going back one step, and then break this term back out into e to the 5x times e to the 2y. But then this term, I could break it out as e to the x times e to the 5x. And in that case, I could factor out e to the 5x. So. And in this case, these two are common terms which could be factored out. Now, whether you go into this or not, it depends on uh, what sort of question is this. If it just tells you to simplify it, that's perfectly fine. But if, let's say, if it's a numerator of a fraction, and you're trying to make that fraction simpler, and there is some power of e to the x at the denominator, you might want to go into these manipulations. It really depends on the uh, actual question. Okay, uh, there is a register going around somewhere, so I would appreciate if people would sign it. Okay, now that was the lows where the base was the same, but there are also some lows when we have got the exponents being the same. And that's again quite logical, uh, can be proven quite easily. If I multiply two different bases together, but I have to raise the multiple to the same power, then I can do that individually. So I can raise the first term to the same power and multiply it with the second term to the same power. 
same for division and you have probably seen these applied numerous times in lectures so First question, 2 over 5 to the minus 3. Now I can break that up as 2 to the minus 3 over 5 to the minus 3. Now I know that 2 to the minus 3 is 1 over 2 to the 3. And I know that 5 to the minus 3 is 1 over 5 to the 3. Dividing fraction by another fraction is keeping the numerator and multiply it by the reciprocal of the denominator which is just one here and then multiplying fractions together top by top, bottom by bottom so that's 5 to the cube over 2 to the cube but now I can apply the same rule backwards and I can say 5 over 2 to the cube so Effectively what happens, if you have got a fraction, probably should have written the original one here, easier to compare. So if you have got a fraction that's raised to the negative power, effectively what's happening is you turning the fraction upside down when you're getting rid of the negative power. So. Next time you don't have to go through this, just remember that a negative power is the same as the reciprocal of the positive power. Okay, number two. What's going on in there? Again, I can raise them to the same power, numerator and denominator separately. A squared and B squared squared will give me B to the four. And the last one. So what I've got there, the, the first term in the multiple is just a normal term. So I can raise them to the same power individually. So that would be 2 to the 4, p to the 4 over 3 to the 4, q to the 4. Oops, multiply. The next one is a negative power. So I can just apply the trick that we've done in the first and switch them around. So 2r comes upstairs, hmm, well, comes to the numerator, and 3pq comes down to the denominator. That way, I remove the negative in the power, and now I can just apply the positive powers. So these will be all to the second powers. Now, can I cancel them by anything? Well, 2 and 2 are in the numerator. Same base, so I can raise them together to the 6th power, because 2 plus 4 makes 6. P is in the numerator, but is also in the denominator. So I need to take the difference of these powers. That will be 4 minus 2 gives me 2. So I've dealt with 2, I dealt with P. R is at the top and there is no other R, so that will be staying there. And that's all the terms in the numerator. What else do we have in the denominator? The 3. So that's going to be the same way 3 to the 6th. The P we cancel down. Um, and then we still have the Q's. So that will be Q to the 6, add the nut. Any questions?
Okay, I'm hoping it's just a kind of warming up for everybody <laughs> rather than anything majorly new. Right, so let's go for logarithms. Now, logarithms are a little bit more tricky eh, because there are some um, rules that you need, to, sorry, sorry, some kind of um, conditions that you need to remember. For example, your base and your numbers behind the logarithms can only be positives. They can't be negative or zero. And on top of that, your base can't ever be one. Why do you think the logarithmic base cannot be one? Exactly. Any power you raise one to any power, that's always going to give you back one. So it's just a mess. So you can't really deal with it. Because then you would end up log one base, anything always gives you uh, <coughs> back the one. So the definition originates from thinking about the powers in a slightly different way. You probably know that undoing powers, very good, when you're undoing, uh, when you're applying um, roots to them. So for example, if you wanted to find out, um, so if you have got 3 squared, find out what, uh, what is the base, when you're looking for the base, you could say root of 9 is equal to 3. So roots gives you back the bases. But logarithms usually give you back the powers. So that's again thinking about exponents but asking a different type of question. So what is the exponent rather than what is the base? Because the roots are always looking for the base, the logs always look for the power. So it's the same thing rearranged but now n is equal to the log b, the log base b m. So anytime you apply a logarithm, you are interested in the exponent. Again, if I'm raising the same base to the same logarithm, then that gives you back the x. And if I'm taking the same base of b to the x, that's going to give you back x again. So just the same way as square root of 3 squares give you back the 3, meaning that the square root and the square are each other's opposite calculations, inverse calculations, the logs and exponents work the same as long as the bases are identical. So anything b raised to log b x always going to give you back the x and log b b to the x always going to give you back x again. Just the same way as I can write it around root 3 squared that is still giving you back the 3. So it doesn't matter which one you apply first, the two always cancel each other out. Okay, two special notations. E, uh, if we're talking about E base, that's always ln, natural logarithm. And if you're talking about the base 10 log, that's always just simply log. Something that you need to keep in mind. Because um, everybody assumes that you know it. So, before we get into the rules, I just want us to practice a little bit uh, the definition so everybody is knowing what these logs do and how they work. Has everybody signed the register? Okay, so question number one. First thing first, this is a 10 base logarithm. So the question is, what power do I need to raise 10 to get to 100? That is quite simple. So log 100 is equal to 10, 2 because 10 to the 2 gives you the 100. Number 2, what power do I need to raise 10 to to end up with 0 0.1? So 10 to some power have to be equal to 0 0.1. For this, you need to remember that 0 0.1 is the same as 1 over 10. So 1 over 10 is 10 to the minus 1 power. So this logarithm 
is equal to negative 1. Now, change the base. 5 base logarithm, 1, what is that equal to? Again, exactly, is 0 because the question is, what power do I need to raise 5 to to get to 1? And by definition, every number to the 0 power is always equal to 1. Next one. Log 9, 3. Again, what power do I need to raise 9 to to get to 3? What do I know about the, the relationship between 9 and 3? Square root. Square root of 9 is equal to 3. The square root is the half power. So this is equal to half. 5 ln e. What is that equal to? 1. Because again, what power do I need to raise e to to get to e? And again, by definition, every number, regardless of what that number is, when I raise that to the first power, that gives me back the same thing. So L and E is always 1. And this is something that you exploit all the time around the logarithmic uh, solving exponential and logarithmic equations. Similarly, log 10 is also 1. And any, any base, if you have got log x, x is 1. Doesn't matter what it is, as long as the base matches the number behind the logarithm, that's always going to cancel down to 1. <laughs> Last question, I'm going to have to write it here. ln 2, what is that equal to? What power do I need to raise to e to, to it to be equal to 2? The slides, yeah. Okay, what do I know about E? What is the value of E? 2.71 something or another. Okay? Now that poses a question straight away. I can't just look at and guess what power to go for. So in specific cases, you actually have to use your calculator. Okay, so make sure that you have got a scientific calculator and make sure that you know how to use it effectively. Because without this, you can't solve these kind of questions. On top of that, in the exam, you can't take in your mobile phones. So you cannot use a mobile phone for a scientific calculator. Therefore, I suggest that you start to take your scientific calculator into the lectures and seminars and get used to how to use the scientific calculator and not the, not the, uh, not the, not, not, not the phone. Because if you get used to how to use your phone in seminar sessions, in the exam, working out how your calculator works will be quite stressful. Okay, so, anybody tell me what buttons I need to press? Ellen. Ellen, there is a special button on your calculator which, give, which gives you the log natural. So you just press Ellen, press 2. One important thing, you always have to close the bracket. In this specific case, it won't, will make no difference. But well, if you have to divide or make some manipulation with this, if you don't close the bracket, it will give you a different answer. So best thing is getting used to closing the bracket all the time. So ln2 gives you... Exactly. So 0 0.69 to two decimal places. So I rounded it because it's, again, an infinitely long uh, decimal number. So, start practicing your calculator use, because it will make the difference. Okay, so that was first in the logs. So, here are the logarithmic rules that we also need to remember. And they all come from the special relationship between exponents and powers. Remember that these are actually exponents. So when we multiply the same base powers together, we have to add the exponents. 
So that's where this rule comes from. So if you take the log of the same, uh, if you take the same base log of a multiple, you can break it out to addition. If, the ta if you take the same base log of a uh, fraction, that is just subtracting them. Remember, when we divided the same bases, the powers got uh, subtracted. And this one is when you're raising a power to a power, that's where it comes from. So that's why you can bring the n down in the front, because raising a power to a power is multiplying them together. Now, this one is a special case when I've got the nth root, remembering that the nth root is the 1 over nth power, so that the 1 over n can be brought out as a multiple. Again, there are a few more explanations. You can see some more exa examples on this specific website for the log rules. But you have to know them. You have to know them. Otherwise, solving questions can be quite difficult. If yep. you've got, if you've got um, a log b of x to any power, can you, you can always bring the power to yeah. the power. Okay. As long as it's just x and to what power. As soon as you have got something else in there, you have to um, assess the case. Can you bring that down or not? Because um, because depending on what you're doing. So, the key here is that there is only one thing behind here. Okay. So if I had something like, oops, log b x plus y to the n, I can still bring that down because there is one thing behind the row. So that would be n times log b x plus y. But that's how far I can go because there is no rule for adding logs, um, adding things together behind the logs. It could be slightly different if you have this. Because then again I can bring the power down at the front. Oops. But then now I know that because these are multiples I can again break them apart as well. So it will be n times log bx plus log by, and that's the same as n log bx plus n log by, and if I wanted to, I can again bring the powers back. <coughs> and again, I can bring them together. So I could have started by applying the power rules here, breaking them apart, and then bringing the powers down. So there are slightly different ways of solving similar problems. Really depends on which one you which one jumps at you first. Okay, so let's look at the practice questions. So the first thing I observe is that all of them are to different powers, so I can't just bring one power out in the front, but they are all multiplied together. So I can break them apart using the addition rule. So this would be log p plus log q squared plus log root r. And now they are all separate, so I can bring out the powers. So that, oops, not equal, plus, hmm, 2 log q plus a half log r, because remember that the square root is a half power. For the second one, log q over r squared. Again, what you observe here, is that is a fraction. So what can we do to the log sign? Take away. 
So log Q minus log R squared. And log Q just stays as it is, but that 2 can be brought down at the front. Now, the last question. We have got separate log signs now here. We want to bring it behind one log sign. So, there are addition and subtraction between the logs, but there are multiples here as well. So I cannot just apply the add and subtract rule. I have to get rid of the multiples first. So I apply the power rule backwards. So this is equal to log p cubed plus log q to the power of n minus log r to the power of 4. Because remember, this addition and subtraction rule for logs only apply when there is no multiples in front of them. So those multiples first have to be removed. And now, I know that these two added together so I can multiply them. And the last one is taken away so that comes down at the bottom. Okay, this is something that people quite often forget about. The multiples in front of the logs have to be removed first before you can apply any of the additional subtraction rules. Questions? Yeah, I don't understand why in the special case, the, the 1 over n um, can't... Okay. One over n. So log root x is log x to the half power, because the root is the half power, and in that case, this is a multiple, so this is a power, so I can always bring a power down to as a multiple, so that will be a half log to the x. That's, that's where the special case uh, is, because yeah. I'm applying this same rule as here, uh. but remembering that this is a uh, 1 over m power. Okay, solving exponential equations. Again, first I'm going to do very simple ones. So the first one, 3 to the x equals 27. Now the reason why this is very simple, because you can observe that 27 is a power of 3. So that can be rewritten re re as 3 to the x equals 3 to the power of 3. Now, on both of the sides of the equation you have got the same basis. There are equal bases. That means the powers have to be equal to, otherwise the equation wouldn't be true. So it simply means x equals 3. In the second one, something similar goes again, because I observed that 16 is a power of 2. What power is 16 of 2? Fourth power. Again, because the bases on each side are the same, it's only true if you've got the same bases. Therefore, the powers have to be equal to. So 5x minus 3 have to be equal to 4. Similar to the other case, but now I ended up with a linear equation in here, which I again have to solve. So 5x equals 7, and x equals 7 over 5. And if you will have some time at home, you can plug this back into here and see that, yes, that's got sorry, into here, and you see that that's actually going to end up with 16. 
strictly speaking, you should always check if your equation is true or not. In most cases, you don't have time for it. Now, this is where you usually would end up having kind of exponential equations in economics. Is that all right if I take the board off? So, what's going on in here? Okay, so constant growth rate, that is the key in here. So when it's a constant growth rate, what formula you need to remember? Hmm? Uh, so v equals e. <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> yeah, but exactly what? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay, so this one is, now I'm going to use F equals P to the E R T because F is future, P is present. Okay, in this specific case, I want to know what will be the population in the future. So why is the population in present? 25 million. What is R R? And what is T stands for? Time. Time. And that's going to be 5, 10, and 15. So we have got three questions to solve in here. So I, so the future in five, the population in five years' time, 25, E to D. Now, what do I put in there? Do I put in the 2.8? 0 0.28, so it's a percentage, I need to convert it into the decimal equivalent. And again, what do you need? Calculator. So how are you going to do it with the calculator? So you pick up the calculator, you type in 25 times, and on top of the LN button, there is the E button, which looks like this, and it's in yellow. Anything yellow on your cal calculator, you need to use the second function button, which is the shift. So you have to press shift LN, and now you just type in 0 0.028 times 5. And that will give you, what has it given you? Okay, in this specific case, yeah, that's fine. So, again, what you want to do, record what you round it to, unless it's actually asked you to round it to what place. Uh, what place. And that would be 28.76 million. Okay, don't forget that the population is in million. Okay, so for the second one, what's going to change? Now that's going to be 10. Now, you can type it all in into the calculator again, but if you are smart with your calculator, all you're going to have to do is use the na navigation buttons. So you're just going to press the back button twice, delete, and replace the 5 with 10. You don't have to go through the whole inputting process again. And that gives you... Thirty three point zero zero eight. Again, stick with the two decimal places. And for the last one, same trick with the calculator. 
but now we're going to replace the 10 with 15 because the last year was in 15 years time so you press the back twice press delete twice and replace the 10 with 15 equal thirty eight point zero five again rounded to two decimal place okay be smart with your calculator and the oh these ones this one can I oh once you clear once you clear it, it okay I don't know what it should be because um, Ah, okay, yours is not even in mathematics, uh, because yours look like this, it's not in the natural display mm -hmm. one. Okay, at the end. Okay. Okay, we'll sort it out. Takes a bit longer than just pressing one button. Okay, any more questions about this? Yes? Can I have a question? Um, a, a growth rate, that ought to be a change over time. Yes. So when it says the growth rate is 2.8%, that means what, 2.8% in a year? It's continuously growing, so it's not it's not going to get 2.8 percent bigger over a year. Yeah. It's getting 2.8 percent bigger instantaneously. It's uh -huh. not. <laughs> there is a big difference between compounding interest and constant growth rate, yeah. because the compounding interest you have got. Okay, at the end of the year, I'm going to end up with 2.8 percent higher mm -hmm. than at the beginning of the year, mm -hmm. but this one is accumulating simultaneously, constantly, on a day-to-day -day basis. That's why it's been replaced with E. I see that, but if, um, the, so the question asks, what's the population in 5, 10, 15 years time? Mm. So yeah. We impose the unit through the question. Yes. Uh, the unit must be implicit in the growth rate somehow. I mean, what if we said, what, what is the population in five days time? We could have carried out the same calculation and got the same result. Um, which would be absurd, of course. So I'm just Yes. To, yeah. Um, in these specific cases, I think the base unit for population growth is always years. So if you were to calculate it in five days' time, you would need to convert the days into fraction of years and then doing it that way. Somebody else wanted to ask something else? No? I was just going to ask, um, do you know if these calculators can do time value of money? Because there were some questions um, on the problem sets. Time value of money. Um, so you, you were talking about future value. Mm -hmm. so what's the present value of, um, I don't know, like 20 million, you know, we're working backwards basically saying, so if, if we've got a population of 33 million in 15 years' time, what's, what's the case now? Um, with these specific cases, then the formula just changes to having e to the rt, e to the minus rt. So we, we don't need to buy a calculator other than this one for the exam? you probably not allowed any other calculator than this one, okay? Anything that's a little bit more complicated, like a proper mathematical calculator, the one that can uh, draw the graphs and the rest of it, will not be allowed for this specific exam. So, so this is the calculator that's allowed. And again, I don't think you can take into the ones that, ca because some of the Casios now can do de the derivatives and integrals. And I don't think those will be allowed in the, uh, in the uh, exam either because you will be tested on your skills of differentiating and, to, uh, and integrating. So there are lists of which ones you can Yes. Because I looked online and I couldn't find an actual list. There is a list online. There, there is a list online. Google, uh, yes. Thank you. Don't use the search on Bergwerk's website. Use the search on Google. For whatever <laughs> reason, Google works. Obviously, that's <laughs> made them billionaires. <laughs> and... <laughs> And, and yes, um, these Cartier ones, the natural display ones, the simple ones are on there. So these are allowed. But there is a kind of list in there. This one said it was allowed in like GCC. Yeah, yeah. Right. if it's, yeah. So, so Google Bergbeck calculator? Bergbeck calculator user. Bergbeck calculators, exams or something. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Any more questions? Okay. Let's look at... Next one then. Okay, so how to solve logarithmic equations. Sorry, yes, logarithmic equations. Now this was again starting with the basic ones.
So, <coughs> oops. Okay, so I'm looking for the number behind the log sign when my base is 100. Okay, for these types of logarithmic equations, I just have to rewrite the logarithm as the exponential, applying the definition of the logarithm, which is basically 100 to the power of 2 thirds have to be equal to x. Okay, so what's going on in here? Cube root of 100 squared equal to x. And I swear I changed that upside down, 3 to the 2. So 3 over 2, because then that would work out nice. I probably opened up the wrong PowerPoint. Because this way, 100 squared is 1,000. And cube root, sorry, uh, is 10,000, and cube root of 10,000, it's not a nice number. So that's again, you rely on the calculator. And I swear I changed it to 3 over 2, so it would work out nice and easy. <laughs> Don't know what happened there, probably didn't save. But if we were to do that problem, that would be much, much nicer, because then that would be 100 to 3 over 2. So that would be the square root of 100 cubed. And remember that the cube and the root can be interchanged. So I can rewrite this as a root of 100 raised to the 3. And I know that root 100 is 10. 10 cubed equals to x, so that should be 1,000. Rather than some infinitely small, funny looking uh, number. Let's look at the second one. Now what I see here is that there's a log on the left hand side on its own, but there are combinations of logs, the same log on the right hand side. So what I'm going to do in this case, I'm going to Simplify this to be one log, because the logarithms are the same. So first I can take the powers. And then because there's an addition between the two of them, I can multiply them together. And because the logs are the same base, therefore the numbers behind the logs have to be equal to. It only works if you've got the same base logs. So then x have to be equal to, now 5 to the minus 2 times 2 to the 3rd, that is basically 2 to the 3rd over 5 to the 2. So your x is 8 over 25, which is again, using the calculator, gives you some simple uh, decimal number. Okay? Any questions? I'm not dividing. I'm not dividing. Okay, you can't divide log signs. All I, know, all I know is that because the logs are the same base, then the numbers behind the logs also have to be equal. Okay? It looks like if I divide it down by the log sign, but that's not a correct mathematical concept to think about it. I wouldn't times both side by e, I would raise both to the e power. Again, because I know it, uh, know it, know that e to the ln x equals to x. And what's stopping you from performing that operation at the first line? So literally just taking that whole I can't line. do it here because I could, but then I would still need to apply the log rules because just simply, uh, okay. So couldn't you like work out um, what two log y is 
the power of E warp. Just gonna pass that. Sorry, again? Couldn't you work out what two times log of five and then to raise that whole thing by E? So this one like E? Yeah. You could, but the trouble here is with log five, that is not an exact number. So at the end, you will have quite a big rounding error by here. That's why we don't start it at the beginning. Uh, strictly speaking, if you wanted to, you could do that e to the ln x equals, looks like an L, e to the minus 2 ln 5 plus 3 ln 2. But then again, this looks a lot more complicated to solve because again, I need to go through the same process. Oh, I, I know it's not the right thing to do, I was just trying to sort out in my head that mm. you know, you're basically just um, taking e to the whole thing to give it a lot. To give yes, it a lot. yes, but you can also think about it because these are basically what you, if you think about it graphically, what you're going, what, what's happening in here when you're solving an equation, you have got log x on one side of the equation and you have got this ln whatever so basically what's going on in here yeah now I just need to think about what does the log function look ln function looks like I think that's what the ln function looks like and basically this is your ln x function you find that specific point somewhere God knows where and then you trace it back down you find that specific x value in here so that means if the log is equal then the x is the numbers behind them have to be equal as well that's kind of what you're applying at the background so you're not dividing them by the log when you're getting rid of e again you're not dividing them by e you're cancelling it out knowing that this is what's happening Effectively, when it comes to problem solving, not going to make a difference because it looks like you would be doing that, but it's a conceptual thinking difference there. Have I answered your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. Now, strictly speaking, what I should have done in both of these cases, I should have written down that x has to be positive because that's again something that's needed, otherwise, the log can't be defined. So that's what I need to do in here again. But there is something else I need to know. As soon as your uh, variable is in the denominator there is this concept coming in dividing by zero which is not allowed so strictly speaking I need to say that ln x minus ln 2 cannot be equal to zero because if I end up with that being equal to zero I would not be able to solve the equation because uh, dividing by zero is not allowed that means that ln x cannot be equal to ln 2, which means that x cannot take the value of 2. So if I solve this equation and I ended up being, LN, uh, being x equals 2, that means I found an invalid solution, so the equation would not have a solution. So how am I going to solve the equation then? Just multiply it by the denominator. So ln x equals 3 ln x minus 3 ln 2. Now what I see, I've got ln x on both sides. 
So I can rearrange them just to be on one side. Three of the variable and one of the variable being on the other side means I can rearrange it as to be two of the variables on one side. And this one I'm going to take to the other side. And again what's going on? Both of the logs have got a multiple in front of them, so before I can equate them and come to x, dig into x, I need to raise these back to the power. And now, again conceptually thinking, because it's the same base logarithm, the equation can only be true if 2 to the third is equal to x squared. So, what can my x value be? Plus or minus root 8. Mathematically speaking, it could be plus or minus. Now, I have to come back and remember that the original equation was a logarithmic equation, which means that the x can only be positive so the only solution here, so the only valid solution is square root of 8. And thankfully, that is not 2. So that is a solution for the equation. So would we have to specify plus or minus 8 and, and do that? You're not doing mathematics degree, so you're not going to be marked down for it. <laughs> if you're not specifying why the negative is not a right solution. And in most cases you don't work with negative numbers anyway because in applied cases these are prices, quantities. No. The, only, um, the only exception when you would be working with profit. But then again, if you take the logs that straight away can't be negative. Okay. Sorry, X has to be uh, more than zero. Positive. 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 Simply because LN that's Hmm? Ln of, of zero. Ln of zero doesn't exist. It's ne actually negative infinity. And Ln of negative numbers doesn't exist. Simply because if you go back to one of the first slides when I start to introduce the log, uh, there are criteria for which numbers we can actually conceptually introduce the log. And that's only positive powers, sorry, positive bases. So the log always have to have a positive base and that base cannot be equal to one either. Because otherwise the logs just won't, don't work. Uh, this one. Yeah, that one. So B is always my base, that always have to be positive and the numbers behind them also have to be positive. Otherwise the log concept doesn't work. Okay. Now, this is more like what you're actually coming across in QT. So, find the price and quantity trade that in equilibrium. What's the first thing that needs to come to your mind when you see the word equilibrium? Exactly. So the quantity demanded have to be equal to the quantity supplied. That is the definition for equilibrium. Now if that's the case, then that means that because on these sides of the two equations I have got equal exactly the same uh, values, so the left hand sides of the equations are equal, therefore the right hand sides have to be equal as well. So straight away that simultaneous equations comes down to 6 minus 1.8 ln p equals minus 4 plus 3.2 ln p. So what you're going to do now rearrange the equation so you have got the variable on one side and the numbers on the other side. So 6 minus 4 gives you positive 10 together and 
minus 1.8 LMP on this side get have to moved over to here. I could have done the other way around, but I don't want to end up with negatives. That's the only reason I'm doing it this way. So 1.8 LMP plus 3.4 LMP gonna give me 5 LMP. Now I want to get to LMP, so I need to remove the 5. And I'm not going to bring that up into the power because that's just going to complicate my life. So I'm just going to divide down by 5. So 2 equals ln P. Again, I can apply the definition of the logs. Remembering that ln is E-based logarithm. So the question is, log EP equals 2. So, what is P equal to? Ex exactly, E squared. Because I have to raise E to the second power, so that would be equal to P. And this is actually what's going on in here, but at this stage, Tony magically writes e squared equals p, remembering the definition of the logarithm. And that is equal to? 7.38. Again, assuming you round it to two decimal places. Yeah. So oh. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> 7.39. Any questions? Okay. Now, sometimes you can't just solve exponential equations because uh, E is 2.71. I have no idea what power of 2.71 will give me 0 0.2. So in this specific case, I need to call the logs to help me. And the very key importance in here is that if I take the same base logarithm then I can bring the power down and I know that ln e is 1 or I can just remember that on the very first pages I've written down for you that ln e to the x is always equal to the x sorry it's always equal to x so what I can do now apply the log to both sides of the equation. So ln ex equals ln 0 0.2. That means x is equals ln 0 0.2. And in most cases, this step you're probably going to omit in your uh, calculations. But remember that this step is going on in here and you are actually applying this identity. And Anybody with a calculator handy? Minus 1.61. Yeah. Okay. Number 2. e to the 2x equals 12. Same scenario. Apply the log to the both sides so that we are cancel e out so you will end up with 2x being ln 12 and now what you've got is x being equal to ln 12 over 2 and this is the case when you're using the calculator you have to remember to close the bracket so you just press, press ln you put 12 in there and you close the bracket and, and then divide down by the 2 
and that gives you x being 1.24 if you don't close the bracket what you are actually calculating is ln 6 without closing the bracket and that's not the same as ln 12 over 2 so be aware of that bracket with the logs and last one So again, apply the log to both sides. That will cancel out E on the left-hand side. So you end up with minus 3x, E equal to ln 0 0.8. And what you need to do now, divide them by the minus 3. And again, put it into the calculator. And that should give you... What's the answer? Okay. <coughs> Let's go back to our population example. Can I rub the board off? Oops. So the country's population is 25 million. Assuming const constant growth rate of 2.8%, how long would it take for the population to double? Again, remember we're using the formula future equal present times e to the rt what are the information that we actually know now I know that the present population is 25 million and then f have to be then 50 million because I want to know when will it double okay the other thing that I know is the rate which is the 2.8 percent which is the 0 0.028 now I know everything except for the time so that gives me an equation that I can solve so 50 million have to be equal to 25 million times e to the 0.028t what I can do now divide them by the 25 so that's going to give me 2 equals e to the 0.028t Now, as soon as the variable is in the exponent, the only way I can bring it down to earth is to apply log to it. So ln 2 has to be equal to the 0.028t. And now I just have to divide them by the 0.028. And that gives me the value of t, which is... I, I didn't catch it. Yeah. Okay. More or less 25 years.
Next topic is differentiating exponents and logarithms. So now we know very well how to solve the equations and how to manipulate the expressions, but how do we differentiate them? And these are the rules that you need to remember. e to the x's derivative is itself, that's a very special function, but as soon as I've got it as a composite function, applying the chain rule, it will give me f prime of x times e to the x. <coughs> if y is ln x, okay, no other base, just the natural logarithm base, then the derivative will be 1 over x. And if it's again a composite version of a logarithmic function, again applying the special case of the chain rule, will allow me to calculate the derivative as f prime of x over f of x. These two comes from the chain rule, but it's easier just to learn them by heart, because then you will be able to do your questions faster. All of the rest of the uh, rules of differentiation stays, so power rule, product rule, and the rest of it. So, y is equal 5e to the x minus 3e to the 2x. Therefore, the derivative will be, well, 5 is a constant multiplier, that stays. e to the x is derivative, e to the x. But this one is, 3 stays as the constant multiplier, but this is now not e to the x, it's e to the 2x. So that is a function of x, so this is now e to the f of x. So here I need to apply the f prime e to the f of x. What's the derivative of the power? 2 e to the 2x. So 5 e to the x minus 6 e to the 2x. That's like a special property of e, or is that just the, log the, the logarithm function? Uh, what is the special property of e? Differentiate it, it just comes out to itself. Yes, it's a special property of e. That's how it works. I mean, um, you can obviously look at proofs why that works, but that's for mathematics course. You just have to learn it. Okay. So the next one, I'm going to write it here, because it's going to be quite long. So what do you need to remember first? What kind of rule you have to apply here, outside of the exponents? The quotient rule. Okay? So this is a quotient of two functions. I have to apply the quotient rule. Okay? Now bear with me with my slightly different way of doing it as to tone is. So the derivative of the top, 2 e to the 2x minus 2 e to the minus 2x. Remember, uh, look back in the page. Uh, e to the f of x is derivative will be f prime of x e to the f of x. So, 2x's derivative is 2, and minus 2x's derivative is the minus 2. So that was the numerator, and I need to multiply that with the denominator. And I have to take away, keep the numerator, and I don't have enough space. And I need to multiply that with the uh, denominator's derivative. So, e to the 5x's derivative is 5e to the 5x, because 5x's derivative is 5. Minus, same rule, 7e to the 7x. And the whole thing, including this term as well, goes over e to the 
the square of the denominator. Nice, Sorry, isn't it? That five stuff is yes, that is that is a mul that is that is coming into here, joining into here. But I knew I was going to need more space. I just didn't know how much more space I needed. Okay, and that is the difficulty of differentiating exponents exponential uh, functions because they just mushroom out into extremely complex function as soon as you've got more than just simply e to the x e to the x is special it doesn't matter how many times you're differentiating it it's gonna stay e to the x but as soon as it starts to become a function of something rather than just x that's what happens yes Um, according to the, what I've heard from the other students, Tony is not very keen on simplifying. Um, you could get into trying to simplify it, and you could get it a little bit simpler, but it's quite a mess. So I'm not going to do that right now. Uh, you're more than welcome to try it home, and I think I've done it. Yeah, so done it. it's it's almost about a page of calculations. And if I didn't make a mistake, the most simplest form I could come up with Not much friendlier than the original one. Still a mess, still can't really see what the hell is going on. Because it's ease all over the place. Okay. Yes? Good question with the first one. Uh, the why did, I mean, that's a composite function, but why did you bring the 2 in front? This one? Yeah. Because e to the 2x is derivative, is the derivative of the power. Yeah. 2x's derivative is 2. and e to the f of x, which is that e to the 2x. So this is what's happening with the exponential functions. As soon as this is not just x on its own, you always have to multiply it with the uh, derivative of the power. Any more questions? OK, let's look at the last one then, which is again quite a nasty one. So first of all, what kind of function is this? What rules do I need to use first? Product rule, because it's a product of two functions, so bracket plus the, stack, um, the other one. But this is also raised to the fifth power. So what does it mean? Chain. And e to the 4x squared, again, it's a composite, so I need to remember that I'm differentiating it using that rule. So. Differentiate the first term, bring the power down, lower the power by 1, and then multiply it with the derivative of the inside, which is 6x squared minus 7. Now I differentiated the first term, and I need to multiply that with the second term. Plus, Leave the first term and differentiate the second term. Now the second term is going to follow the rule of this. So what's the derivative of the power? 8x and multiply that with e to the 4x squared. 
again, a relatively complicated function become a lot more complicated function. And again, I wouldn't even attempt to kind of try to simplify it because I'm definitely going to make a mistake somewhere. And on top of that, this is the fourth power, this is the fifth power. I will need to remember the binomial distribution, the bi uh, sorry, not, not distribution, the binomial formula to be able to break those brackets up. Doesn't work even looking at it. Uh, I wouldn't even factor the e to the 4x squared out because that's not going to take me any, anywhere closer to understanding what's going on in here. Any more questions about these? On, on the factorizing, I think Tony said in one of the lectures not to do it mm. because then people make mistakes and they get the marks taken off. Yeah. Just there you go. Whatever Tony says, that is what you should go by. Okay, so differentiating exponents, now we all know very well. Let's look at how to do the logs. And remember, when we had ln f of x, then the derivative was f prime of x over f of x. So the first case scenario, what we've got in here is y equals 5 ln x plus 3 ln 2x. So the derivative, 5 is a constant multiplier, so that's not going to change. And ln x's derivative is 1 over x, so that will be 5 over x. 3 is a constant multiplier, so that's going to stay. And ln 2x is now a composite version of the ln. So, in the fraction, I need to put the derivative of the 2x, which is 2 at the top, over 2x. So what's going on in here? I can cancel out, and I end up with y prime being equal to 5 over x plus 2, not sorry, 3 over x. Sorry, where, did, where did you get the 5 over x? The first, the, the 5 stays, constant multiplier, yeah. and ln x's oh, yeah. derivative is 1 over x. Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. No worries. Okay? What the hell is going on in here? How on earth did I end up with 8 over x from there? Well, let's just look at it a little bit. So, 5 ln x plus 3 times ln 2 plus ln x. That is 5 ln x plus 3 ln 2 plus 3 ln x. That is 8 ln x plus 3 ln 2. It's the same expression. I just applied some of the log rules in here. Now this one is a constant. So if I was to differentiate this version of the same, that is 8 ln x. And that's why it's exactly the same as this. I hope I haven't confused people with this. It doesn't matter which way you do it. In this case. Okay? Can I wrap the board off? Sorry, can you do that again? This one? Yeah. So 5 ln x, I haven't done anything. Yeah. The 3 ln x, I see that it's a multiple in here, so I applied the multiplication rule, which will be adding the logs. Remembering that the whole log was multiplied by 3, so each term will have to be multiplied by 3. So I break up the bracket, and then what I see is that I have got 5 of the variable plus 3 of the same variable, 
that's going to give me eight of the same variable together, so that's why it's eight ln x, and the three ln two stays. Now, three ln two might not look it, but it's a constant, because two is a number, log of a number is a number, and a number multiplied by a number is a number. And I remember that constant derivative is always zero. So that's why when I'm differentiating, that term will disappear, and I just need to differentiate the 8 ln x, which will be 8 times 1 over x, which is this one here. Right, question two. Um, I can't do anything in here because there is no rule for logs when there is addition behind the logarithm sign. So I just have to use the composite rule for uh, logs, the chain rule for logs. So basically, what is the derivative of the inside? 2x plus 7. And I have to put that over the original, which is x squared plus 7x. And I can't do anything with it. Even if I factor x out from the numerator, the denominator and the numerator will be different. So that is it. So the third one. What rules do I have to use in here? Mm -hmm. And the log chain. I'm definitely going to mess it up. Okay, there's no way I'm going to differentiate it in this specific format because that is just too many rules all over the place. So easy to make a mistake. Luckily, I know the rules of log. I know the rules of logarithms. So instead of going in with the big guns and do the differentiation right now, I'm going to make my logs a little bit simpler. So, it's a fraction, so I can write it as ln 5x squared minus ln 4x minus 3. A lot friendlier, isn't it? Plus 3, no. The log is in front. So I can't bring the, if I was to bring the negative in, that would end up in the power, not in the multiple. Okay? Now, if I wanted to, I can still break these ones apart, but I can just do the differentiation right here and they will cancel out anyway. So I'm just going to do the differentiation right here. This is ln f of x, so I need to find f prime of x over f of x. So what's the derivative of 5x squared over the original? And this one, again, there is no rule for subtraction behind the log sign, so I just have to keep it as it is. And again, apply the f prime of x over f of x rule. 4x minus 3's derivative is... And then just put that over top of the original. Well, I can see here now that x cancels down. And again, I cancel it down to 2. So y prime equals 2 over x minus 4 over 4x minus 3. 
no way I would have gotten the same answer as easily if I went and differentiated it right away here. So whenever it's possible, apply the log rules to make the function simpler before you differentiate it. Will make a whole lot of difference to your answers. Last question. <coughs> what rules do I have to use in here? So what function is this? Exponential. It's an exponential and a logarithmic. And what do I do with them? Product. Multiply them so they are a product. I have to use the product rule. Unfortunately, each term is also a composite. So I have to use the special case for chain rule for the exponents and the logarithm. Now in this case, breaking out the log, applying the log rules, will not make it much, much simpler. Because uh, there is not an overly complicated function behind the log. So in this case, I'm not going to go and break them apart. So I'm just going to leave it as it is. So this is the first term. Its derivative is f prime of x times e to the f of x. So what's the derivative of 2x cubed? 6x squared multiplied by the original and then multiplied by the second term untouched plus first term stays as it is and I need to multiply that with the derivative of the second term the second term is a composite of a log so that derivative will be f over f sorry f prime of x over f of x so 2x cubed derivative is 6x squared over 2x cubed. So again, using that rule. And this one, I can cancel down. So that is the one and only simplification I am willing to do with this one. And that, on the numerator, there's only three left. So at three, I'm going to bring it out in the front. And at the denominator, I've only got x left. The only other simplification I kind of see here would be factoring out the 3e e to the 2x cubed. But will that make it simpler? Not really. Still won't be able to see what's going on. So this would be the last. I would leave it in this format. Anytime you suspect I made a mistake, stop me. Because I might have made a mistake, okay? Well, as long as nobody's complaining, I'm assuming I've done it right, okay? <laughs> Now, logarithmic differentiation is probably not the easiest concept that you come across. So I have got these two videos that you can check out at home and uh, look at the concept in a little bit more details. This one, the patrickgmt.com, this specific example uses exponential functions. So that's why I put that on the top. So this kind of shows you where the logarithmic differentiation can come handy with exponents. This one is a longer video, that is just one example about 5-10 minutes. This is a longer video, around half an hour, and it shows you more examples. But it's generic examples, it's using trigonometric functions. So, try to avoid the exact differentiation rules in there, and try to just concentrate on what the concept is trying to explain you. Uh, and if that doesn't make sense, discard it. And then just don't go back again. Okay? <laughs> Uh, but I, 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 like, I like that video quite well because it sort of 
slowly takes you from start and kind of shows quite a few examples. Shame that they are all trigonometric because they actually aim more engineers rather than economics, economists, and they work with trigonometric functions all the time. Okay? So, I mean, what is the purpose of logarithmic differentiation? Why on earth do we do it? Well, I don't know about you, but I usually have to know why I'm doing something before I even have a chance to understanding what I'm doing. So, anybody a guess why do we do the logarithmic differentiation? It was like that example you gave before with the population. If you had something like that and you needed to maximize it, yeah. you need, need to use differentiation. Yes, the and... The derivative of the log function is the growth rate. Uh, yes, and then basically what's happening in there, as you've seen with the previous examples, as soon as you've got not a simple exponential function or a simple function, uh, what's actually happening when you need to differentiate it again and again, it mushrooms out, it becomes really, really complex. So the logarithm, taking the logs for a complex exponential function makes it simple and then you would be able to differentiate it much, much simpler than if you were to do the original one. So, let's look at the actual question and uh, try to take through the steps of the logarithmic differentiation. So, land boat is increasing in value according to the formula. So we know that V is equal to 1000 times 2 to the cube root T. The discount rate is 0 0.09. How long should the land be had to maximize its value? So, here comes a formula you need to remember. And because you've already done it, what's the formula? Okay, in this kind of specific application questions, you're not going to be given the formula. Something that you have to remember. Okay? And whoever told you that you have to only understand mathematics and everything will be fine was kind of a liar. Because as long as you understand it, it will be easier. But you still have to learn a lot of facts and a lot of formulae. Okay? So, what's going on in here then? P will be equal to a thousand times two to the cube root t e to the minus zero point zero nine t. And what I need to do here now, I need to maximize this function. Now, if I so do you need to put brackets around the thousand times two to the um would I? No, there is no plus here. They multiplied. So I don't have to, but if it makes but if it makes it easier for me to see, by all means use the bracket. Having the bracket in a multiple doesn't really alter anything. Okay? Now, if I was to go into uh, maximizing here, I would need to find the first order derivative. And as you've seen, as long as you have got a product of two exponential functions, the first of the condition will end up being something extremely overly complicated and you would have to solve that equation where you have got 2 to the power of some, uh, where the power is t and then e to that same power. So it's almost, unless you have got really high uh, trained mathematical skills, it's almost impossible to solve. So, that's why we take the log. Because if I take the log,
and observe that I've taken the natural log, not the base 2, because base 2 log, if I want to differentiate that, that becomes more complicated. So the ln x is always 1 over x, but base 2 x, if I was to differentiate that, that would be something completely different. And now I can apply the log rules. So ln p will be equal to ln 1000 plus, because there's a multiplication sign between them, uh, ln 2 to the cube root t plus, because again there's a multiplication sign in there, ln e to the minus 0.09t. First term is just stays as it is. What I've got in here is 2 raised to a power. So that power can be brought down as a multiple. And at the same time, I remember that the cube root of t is the same as t to the first power. Uh, sorry, t to the third power. What do I know about ln and e? Cancel each other out, they are inverse functions. So that is just becoming the power. So actually I don't need the positive sign, I need the negative. Okay? Now, not friendlier to differentiate, isn't it? That is the whole point of the log differentiation. So what you need to find now is Oops, what am I writing? Now, your first order condition, your first order condition for the original maximization problem is dp dt being equal to zero. That is your goal to get to. Remember, if we went to here, differentiating it, would it end up with a too complicated function? Would be quite difficult to solve. But what we got in here now, we just need to differentiate it these, d ln p dt, and I'm still at this side, but what I've got in here, I know that p is the function of t, so strictly speaking, is the same rule now as the ln f of x. And that is f prime of x over f of x. Or otherwise, 1 over p times dp dt. Okay, that was the left hand side, okay? So I just that with the left hand side so far. Let's move on to the right hand side now. The derivative of ln 1000 is. zero. It's a constant, it's a number, it's gone. Yeah. The derivative of t to the one third time ln 2 is a third t to the minus two third times ln 2. Again the ln 2 is a constant multiplier that stays in the term and minus 0 0.09 t's derivative is minus 0 0.09. Okay? Now remember, my goal is to have dp dt equals zero. But now from this equation, from here to here, I can rearrange it and I can express dp dt just by multiplying both sides by p. And that has to be equal to zero. And now I have got my first order condition in a relatively simple form. <coughs> okay? I've got a multiple, p times the bracket equals zero. I've got two, two uh, possibilities either p is zero or the bracket is zero. Can p be zero? 
why. Why can I say always with confidence that P is not zero? <laughs> Again, but if I just kind of uh, come back to the original function, okay, what is the smallest value of t that I can ever get? T is time. What is the smallest value of time that I can ever get? Zero. zero. Two to the power of zero, one, is something, uh, e to the power of zero, one. So it's never going to be zero. Okay? And again, economical sense, you know, if you are a uh, present value or price or, I don't know what that is, sorry, that's economics, is zero, then you have got no uh, optimization problem because nothing's not going to increase to anything. Okay? Hmm? <laughs> so that means only the bracket can be equal to zero. Okay, and I need space. Am I going to need the original function? Ah, I've got it in my hand. Okay, so start rearranging it. A third times t to the minus two third ln two has to be equal to zero point zero nine. Multiply up by the three, divide them by the ln two. Zero point two seven over ln two. Okay, three times zero point zero nine gives you 0 0.27 and then the ln2 you divide down by now I want t on its own t on its own means t has to be to the first power power of 3 would not be enough has to be minus 3 over 2 what you need to think about here is what is the number I need to multiply this to end up with positive 1 because that's what you want if there is no nothing in here that's always positive 1 power so what do I need to multiply the minus 2 third by to end up with positive 1 oops and that is a negative 3 over 2 Now remember that negative trick when it applies to a uh, fraction. That means I need to swap the numerator for the denominator and then I can remove the negative from the power. And here comes again a trick about the calculator. Because you want to be able to calculate this quite easily. So... What you want is start with a bracket, put in a fraction. In the top of the fraction, you want to put in ln2, remembering that you have to close the bracket, otherwise, you end up with a syntax error. Press the down button, come down to the denominator, put in 0 0.27, press the, le sorry, the right button in the calculator twice, actually, just once, sorry, close the bracket and then you press the power button which is this one and then again press the fraction because you want a fraction in the power um, or in this specific case you could just type in 1.5 because 3 halves is 1.5 so that would give you exactly the same answer and then hit equal and then t would give me 4.11 and I'm going to double check yeah okay again that's rounded to two decimal places now before we move on 4.11 
that's exactly why I was going to ask you the question now. If I kept the if I kept the uh, land exactly four years, would we would I achieve the maximum of the land? If I kept it for five years, would have I achieved the maximum? No, because that would have gone over the maximum time. So the best guess is remembering that one year is 12 months. So you multiply the 12 by 0 0.11. That would give you some sort of uh, monthly base, which would give you a closer estimate of how many uh, years and months. Four years and probably about one month, one and a half months, something along there would be the absolute optimal time. Um, I probably would leave it as 4.11 and double check with Tony if he expects you to round the answer to years or not. Okay? So if you do those then calculator things again, I didn't get the 4.11. I, I couldn't get these three, 3 over 2 at the end. Okay. So bracket. Yeah. Fraction. Yeah. Uh, LN2, close the bracket. Right. Come down, 0 0.27. Yeah. Come out, close the bracket, oh. that power. Oh, what did you do to that power? Oh, okay. Okay. And then fraction again. Yeah. Three, two. Okay. Okay. okay it takes time to get used to the calculator if you haven't used it for a long time, so give yourself time. Now, what have we found here? We found the stationary point. Okay? We found where the first order derivative is zero. But what I need to do now is I have to go back and check the second order condition and I need to double check if this is actually a maximum. Because I could have ended up finding a minimum. And I definitely don't want to keep my land and sell it when it's the lowest price possible. And of, on top of that, if it's your job and you go and tell your boss that, oh, this is what we need to sell, and then <laughs> instead of a maximum, you tell him a minimum, you're probably not going to have a job for a long time. Okay. So, okay. This is the one that we need because that's the first order condition. So I'm going to keep that there. So the second order condition I have to differentiate this again. Okay? One thing that I have to keep in mind all the way through is that P is a function of T. So this is actually a product of two functions here where t is explicitly shown here, but p is implicit in here, uh, t is implicit in p, I don't know exactly, I mean I do know, uh, because that was the original function, I just don't want to substitute that back into here and go through that problem again. But, it's a product rule, so it will be dp dt times the bracket, plus p times the derivative inside the bracket. So what's going on in here? I need to differentiate this with respect to t, so I need to bring the minus 2 third down. So that's going to give me minus 2 over 9 t to d minus 5 over 3 ln 2 and that's a constant number, so that derivative is zero. Not very friendly. But what do I know here? What do I know about dp over dt? Equal it's equal zero because I'm checking it at the optimal solution. Okay, so at the optimum, either minimum or maximum, 
the first order derivative is always zero. Now, if this one is zero, then this whole term is zero. So the sign, because we need to ass uh, assess the sign of the second order derivative, will only depend on that term. So what I need to see is this. And I need to see if this is positive or negative. Okay? There's a big fat negative sign in here. The only thing I need to think about is there anything in the uh, anything in the expression that would be negative and would switch the sign. Well, p is positive, that's for sure. T is positive because time can't ever be negative. Okay? And a positive number raised to any power whatsoever is always positive. And ln 2. Okay? Again, what I need to remember that this one is also positive. So if it wasn't ln 2, but if it was like ln of 0, 1, it could be. It could be negative. So you actually have to double check because ln is very, if ln is a very small number, that could be negative because remember that the log function, ln of x, look like this. So that can go into the negative end. So be careful. Um, basically, less than one, it will be negative. If you're not sure, put it into the calculator. So, thankfully, this is negative, so yes, that was a maximum. Okay? Anything, any questions whatsoever? No? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this one, yeah? Yeah. Why do you get Because the P is a function of t. Remember that the p was v times, sorry, uh, e to the minus rt. So that's always a function <coughs> of t. So basically, uh, basically it's a product. The of yes. So in here, P is a function of t, so if I take the second order derivative with respect to t, I have to differentiate p as well. I mean, strictly, I mean, it's uh, because we know that dp dt going to be zero, that's why we don't bother with it. But um, to actually see what's going on, you would probably put back this original function in here, but then again, it's just going to get messy. So don't put the original function back, remember that p is a function of t, and then show that you've done the differentiation and then refer back to the fact that at the maximum or minimum the first of the derivative is always zero so that term will just disappear magically and don't have to worry about it. Yeah? Could you go over again the process of finding out whether it's a maximum? This one? Yes. Okay, so there is a multiple here okay, so I can rewrite this as minus 2 over 9p t to the minus 5 over 3 ln 2. Okay? So there's a big negative number here, which is an encouraging sign, because I want it to be negative. But what I need to double check now, is there anything else in the expression that could cancel this negative sign out? So the value of p, I don't exactly know, but I know that p can't be negative. T same here. T is time. The biggest, the smallest value of T that would be zero, but then I would end up with zero. That wouldn't really help me. And I did not end up with zero because T was 4.11. So I'm, I'm evaluating it at the maximum. So T is not zero, it's positive because it was actually 4.11. And the ln2 is the other one that could trip me up, but the ln2 exact, uh, ln2 is positive. 
Uh, ln can be negative, but only if the number behind the log is less than 1. So that's why every one of these giving me a positive value, therefore the overall is a negative. So you say that if, if t was 0, that... Um, um, if t was, was 0, then there would be no question in here because it would be equal to 0. Okay. Because 0 to whatever power is always 0, anything multiplied by 0 will give me 0. But again, one thing that I mustn't forget, that we are evaluating it at the optimal solution. And at the optimal solution, t was actually 4.11. Okay? Any more questions? Right, I think... Now... There was another type of question that was in the problem set. Kind of a second stage to this calculation. Now we want to know whether to buy this land or not at the price of 2,500. Assume the same value function and discount rate and find the discounted present value to compare with the price. Now for ease of calculation I gave you t being 4. But if you wanted to really if you wanted to be really precise, the 4.11 probably would give you a better uh, rate or comparison. Okay, so we know that V is equal to a thousand times 2 to the cube root T. Uh, we also know that R is 0 0.09. We know that T is 4. What are we going to do here? We need to find the discounted present value. To be able to do that, what do we need to know first? Okay, what else do we need to know? Okay, we know T, we know R, we're looking for the present value. So, it's just one formula, one equation. I need to know everything else other than P to be able to solve it. So I need to calculate the actual future value of that land. So, I need to substitute back into this formula, the T equal 4. And if you put that all into the calculator, you end up with 3,005.08. And now I know everything that I need to be able to calculate the discounted present value. So that is 3,005.08 times e to the minus 0 0.09 times 4. And again, using the calculator, the land's present value is 2,096.57. So these are the numbers. What do they tell you? Would you buy or would you not buy? 
Why would you not buy? It says just 2,500, and it's only worth 2,096. Now, that is theory. In practice, I don't know, if you lived in London, you knew that property prices and land prices just never fall. <laughs> okay, so it, it really depends on other circumstances as well. Practice, you'd probably doubt your valuation model. <laughs> well, this is the theory, that's what I'm saying. I mean, you know, it's nice and lovely, it works in well in, 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 in an environment when you know every risk, all of the risks and everything. Um, but, you know, real life is a lot messier than this. Okay, last topic for the, uh, for the day is homogeneity. And I just copied and pasted the definition and I believe I brought it out from the notes. And this is what uh, kind of have to be remembered every time you work with homogeneity. Okay? And now we're just going to look at uh, the concept of return to scale. Okay? So, if the degree of homogeneity is smaller than 1, then that will be a decreasing return to scale. If it's exactly one, it's a constant return to scale. And if it's bigger than one, it's an, it's an increasing return to scale. Now, just, uh, just think about that a little bit. So, the constant return, uh, the return to scale was, let's say that you have got two variables. And then you have got this one. The simpler case. Okay? What does it actually mean when I'm putting the lambda x in here instead of the x. What do I do my, to my input? I'm increasing not by one lambda. I don't know what that is. I'm increasing it by a number. I could double it, triple it, make it five times bigger. I'm increasing my input. And what happens in here, my output will have increased by lambda to the n power. Okay? Now, if n is equal to 1, then what happens here is by how many uh, times I increase my input, input, my output will come out as many times increased. Okay? So if I double the input, the output will double as well. If my n is bigger than 1, I'm going to end up with a higher than lambda output increase. So if I doubled the input, my output will, will be bigger than doubled. And if I n is less than 1, then even though I doubled my input, my output will increase less than double. So these are the kind of, this is the difference in here. That's why it's important for you to know. Uh, if it's uh, increasing, decreasing, or constant, because obviously you don't want to put extra effort in when the production will go down. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's what the mathematics behind it tells you. Let's look at some functions. So to find if it's uh, what's its homo uh, degree of homogeneity, the simple thing that I need to do is replacing k and l by lambda k and lambda l. So my f lambda k lambda l will be lambda k squared plus 6 times lambda k times lambda l plus 7 times lambda L squared. So I'm just substituting the original K's and L's for lambda K and lambda L. 
And now I'm trying to manipulate it and see if I can factor lambda at a common power out from all of them and end up back with the original. So uh, powers of rules, no, rules of powers, lambda squared k squared plus 6 times lambda k lambda k, that means lambda squared 6kl plus 7 times lambda squared l squared lambda, uh, lambda squared 7l squared. Now conveniently, lambda squared is in every single term so I can factor out lambda squared and now I compare what I ended up here with the original. Is that the same? It is the same. So what can I say about this function then? What's the degree of homogeneity? And it's an increasing return to scale. Okay? Because n is bigger than 1. So what's that say? Is this not what Tony used? A H O D? Homogeneity of degree 2. So, this here asked to find out the power of lambda. Yes. The power of lambda, always the power of lambda is always, always that's the degree of homogeneity. And based on power, we can include uh, whether it's increasing or decreasing. Or, or constant, yes. So if it was just lambda without any power, yeah. then that means it's a uh, degree of one, yeah. and that would be a constant. So Q equals Does that mean that, that it's got increasing returns? Yes. Oh, okay. Same rule here. Or rather, same process. I'm replacing k with lambda k. and L with lambda L. So what I've got in here is 0 0.9 lambda to the 0 0.2 K to the 0 0.2 and lambda to the 0 0.6 L to the 0 0.6. So lambda is multiplied together so that will be lambda to the 0 0.8 because 0 0.2 plus 0 0.6 makes 0 0.8 now I've got 0 0.9 k to the 0 0.2 l to the 0 0.6 and that was my original function 0 0.9 k to the 0 0.2 and l to the 0 0.6 so the degree of homogeneity is 0 0.8 that is less than 1, so it's a decreasing return to scale function. These homogeneity questions are not as complicated as they come across. Is there any way when you look at the function of knowing if it's going to be homogeneous or not, do you just have to work it out? Not always. They're not always as straightforward, unfortunately. Um, I would always go and do it. I mean, maybe once you have done enough practice questions, you probably have a sense of when it is and when it isn't. Um, other than that, uh, because I've learned the, the long way and I've learned the sort of wrong way of assumptions in mathematics, <laughs> don't always go well. <laughs> yes? Two. 
in this case actually is 0.8. Yeah. If there's an input of 10, yeah. whatever it's capital or later, yeah. so the output, my output will increase by 10 raised to 2? Uh, okay, so if your input is 10, yeah. that means uh, increased by 10, that means that your lambda is 10. So you put 10 times as much capital and 10 times as much labor into this specific production. Yeah. You would get out 10 to the power of 0 0.8 in this specific in case. This case yeah. In this case. In this case, yeah. I would get out 10 to the power of 2. So for this production function, if I, uh, if I input 10 times more capital and 10 times more labor, I would end up with 100 times more output. In here, if I put in 10 times more capital and 10 times more labor, I end up with less than 10 times more input. Because 10 to the 0 0.8 would be less than 10. I don't know exactly what. Put it in the calculator, you find the exact value, and that means you would get smaller input, uh, sorry, smaller output uh, than uh, what you put in. Yeah. The difference between homogeneous degree 2 and homogeneous degree 3 is not the same as degree 3 and degree 4. So okay. Because these are exponential, these powers. Okay, so it's not doubles, triples, 8 to the power of. Let's look at the last one. And then we can go home. <laughs> okay, um, the Schoen book or Schoen's or whatever I have got quite a few log differentiation ones in them so you can do a bit more practice on them because I think that's more out of the whole lot that's probably the most challenging what we went through so there are some practice questions in, in there to, to do the log differentiation Where, sorry? Uh, anybody got it handy? Anybody? Do you mind? Showing it to us. It's a red uh, problem solving book. Can I just show it to the camera as well? <laughs> okay, so it's this specific book that people want, and I'm hoping I'm keeping it close enough. Well. Okay, so it's had got 710 solved problems throughout every kind of economical questions. Now, not every single question is solved the same way as Tony teaches it. So if the solution process in there, not familiar, confuses you, just ignore it. The important thing is that you can compare your final answer with the book's final answer, and that should be matching. Doesn't matter how you get to it. Okay? So last function so it will be 4 times lambda k times lambda l to the power of 2 plus lambda k so that is equal to lambda cubed because lambda times lambda squared is lambda cubed 4 k l squared plus lambda k. The highest power of lambda I can factor out from both terms is lambda. But then what I left with is lambda squared 4k r squared plus k. And that is not the original function. Because I can't factor out lambda cubed from both of them. What does it mean for me now? It's a not homogeneous function. And I think that's it. Any questions?
Yes. yes. Um, why would B be uh, modulus in that case and C isn't? Because it's like lambda 0.2 and also lambda mm. 0.6. The difference here is that everything is multiplied together. Right. And there are addition here. So when I'm multiplying together, I can bring the lambdas together, and then I can bring it at the front. But when they are added, I have to be able to factor it out in a different way. OK? Is that all? OK, anybody wants to ask me any questions, I'm going to hang around a little bit longer. Just let me turn the camera off.